web navigation. Yep. Um, how, how does it? How does that fit into your portfolio? Do you see that as part of the skills cloud? Um, and and is that an L and D purchase, or are you talking to other parts of, of of the enterprise with that product? Yeah. So it's an interesting capability, and in fact, we purchased out of your uh, in your backyard in uh, Seattle. Uh, the founder was uh, ten years at Microsoft. <laughs> um, the, both the wife and husband team. Uh, so my guide is a nice adjacent uh, product uh, to what I would call the uh, the learning experience or uh, knowledge cloud. It is a digital adoption platform, and uh, but it does do, do a fantastic job of in-app uh, learning and training. A lot of learning and training that most of us need in this new, uh, you know, fourth industrial revolution is just learning how to do stuff in using different tools. And so if people want to learn Salesforce or people want to learn uh, SAP or new version, and especially all the software uh, and technology is becoming cloud-based, you know, the, the the rate of change of the cloud software is very rapid, right? Every couple of months, there's a new version. And uh, uh, the the users, they get very confused. So I think the L&D department has, uh, is getting more and more involved in this business process training and new tools and technology training. And that's where my guide fits in because we get integrated into any one of the software and business processes. And it enables uh, the digital adoption. That's why the category is now called digital adoption platform. So it fits in very nicely with our overall, uh, you know, lifelong learning and upskilling, reskilling platform. But at the same time, it is a, a slightly adjacent category. And so the buyers uh, are both, uh, we have L&D people buying it for their workday and their cornerstone or any of those rollouts and they want to explore mm-hmm. and teach a certain business process. We have like World Bank. We have a webinar coming up with World Bank this week on Thursday where they're going to show in the webinar how they use my guide for their more than 20,000 plus employees for their change management and digital adoption. Uh, but at the same time, um, you know, it's also growing into a whole new vector uh, which you mentioned about automation, right? So business processes are going to get more and more automated. And if you think about, so the buyer is also an IT department and uh, CIOs and CTOs. Uh, the other a big trend that I see is that, you know, the, the notion of talent uh, that the L&D and the CHROs have to deal with is not just human talent anymore, but you have to look at talent both from human and machine talent. And so very soon, the L&D department, which is currently only involved in the learning and development of the, of the human talent, will have to get involved in the learning and training of the machine talent. And that's where, you know, this my guide comes in because it allows you to kind of program with guides how to do those business processes. That's a really interesting, really interesting idea, Carl. And I, I've heard this uh, combination of like machine learning and human learning and, you know, the robots and humans working together in a fourth industrial revolution scenario as called like superhuman work. <laughs> and um, it, it's, it's interesting that L&D departments uh, need to take a role in, in teaching the robots too. I, um, that, that is fascinating stuff. Yeah. Hey, um, one just last thing on, on the business of ed tech, and then I want to talk about some other areas that I, I know you have uh, some really interesting ideas around. Um, and, and that is, um, I'm interested in what you've learned from your customers um, about, about how to buy and deploy and be successful with learning platforms. And I, I say this because I know a lot of my peers and myself included, um, you know, making a platform purchase decision can be a very scary thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of money on the line often. Uh, there are a lot of stakeholders within your organization, not least your IT department. Um, and, and there's often complex integration and legacy systems. And, and, and frankly, a sort of history of being disappointed by learning technology. Um, what, how do you see your most successful customers approaching this, this task? That's a great question. Well, so, you know, the, the number one principle is always, uh, you know, keep it simple. Uh, and uh, we try to help our customers to simplify the implementation. And it, it's done really through a very highly configurable product. So the architecture is more important than just a list of features. Uh, so architecting it right from, and, and that's more on the vendor side as a, as a software provider. 
mm. right? But uh, but also from the buyer side that, you know, you look for a product not because it is a shiny UX or just because uh, it has a lot of features. I think that has gone down, you know, badly uh, with, um, and, and that could have been one of the many reasons why many software uh, implementations have failed. I think the most important thing is about the configurability, the customizability, and the, and the open standards to integration. Those three things are critical in any software. I don't think just it's an L&D, but if you look at any category, whether it is, you know, marketing automation, sales automation, manufacturing, finance, in all of them, you know, when you're a large enterprise, you're going to need a lot of configurability. And that's where sometimes failed thing, failed uh, implementations happen because the software mm. is not capable of configuration. Some customization will be needed no matter how much uh, you may not want to do it uh, to the extent that it does not create a big burden in the post uh, releases. And the third most important thing, as I mentioned, is the open standards uh, for integration like XAPI and things like that. Uh, so we have uh, really been, uh, uh, you know, uh, fortunate in uh, driving all of these three core things into our platform thinking or design thinking. And uh, we guide very successfully to our customers uh, to look at from these lenses and uh, have a very successful implementation and then also try to avoid a lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the mindset that I want to do everything uh, in one product because there are certain things that's more suited in a, in different products. So there is no such thing as a silver bullet that, you know, I have this HRIS system and they will, it's do it's going to do everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, yeah. I think, I think that that really is a, a little bit of a challenge for us. Like in that uh, often people, you know, want to check all the boxes in your RFP. And, exactly. Uh, maybe the, R, maybe the RFPs themselves need to get more real and uh, more realistic and focused, but, uh, Sometimes we, we um, you know, a lot of vendors promise to do everything and, and uh, that's just baking in challenges for the future. Well, success, uh, I mean, success comes from focus, right, in any area. And the more you go broad and you put 250 checklist in a RFP from one platform, you're like not thinking focused. Uh, and so there is always going to be a market for best of the breed. The reason why we, uh, uh, EdCast and many other companies in our category is successful is because you can't just think of one software can do everything. So you will have to be, this will remain a separate category. It's not that your LMS can transform, morph into this. It's not your HRIS can morph into it. They will all offer similar features, but trying to do everything into one software, it can be a disaster. Now, I think the good news in this, just to round off this conversation, is that like a SaaS platform approach, which most vendors have moved to, and I know you you certainly are a SaaS platform too, you know, does give you a little bit more flexibility and opportunity to to experiment and try and and sort of um, uh, incrementally sort of roll out um, different approaches. Do you see customers doing that experimentation with your platform? Yeah, I mean, very much so, because I think one of the the, the big, uh, you know, foundational thing that is required to survive and thrive in this uh, fourth industrial revolution is this, uh, you know, this pace of change and this uncertainty, right, in the book cover, what we call. Now, that's where cloud and uh, this best of the breed platforms are super helpful because as your business process change, as you say, well, you know what, I am going to now need uh, tomorrow in the next two months, I need to train, you know, 500 people into this uh, new process. You would need a capability that is able to configure, set up and all of that, you know, to that new skills, to that new content, to that new audience, to create that dynamic groups. So there's a lot of that, uh, you know, uh, configurability, that ability to flexibility, the ability to make things happen in a very short, compressed period of time. This is not this old world of LMS where you can go and take your uh, one year to go and find the right uh, catalog provider and then they will update their course. So cloud and, um, you know, the the best of the breed, which has a very focused thing on specifically helping you to create your agile workforce, upskilling, reskilling, uh, that becomes very uh, of very paramount uh, importance. Um, let's let's shift focus a little bit, if we can, Carl. Um, I, when I last saw you, you were heading off to Davos to um, World Economic Forum, um, where I think you've been a couple of times. And I think you were participating in a panel on the future of work. Um, how on earth did you manage to get a ticket to the World Economic Forum? 
And uh, and what did you learn at the session this time? Well, <laughs> good question. Uh, yeah, the ticket to World Economic Forum is super expensive and super difficult. I started going there. When I, <laughs> I, I got my first invitation when I was at the White House as the first uh, one of the first presidential innovation fellow for President Obama. And then uh, since then, uh, I've kind of uh, found my way to to get there every year. Uh, this year we did, uh, uh, we ran two panels there, um, uh, on future of work and we invited in each panel about 20, uh, CXOs, uh, CEO, CHROs from, uh, Fortune 500 companies. They were, uh, already there. So Davos is a great place. It's the, the most unique uh, venue where, you know, pretty much every, uh, just key decision makers from global 2000, global 1000 companies are there and also the government officials. So we brought in the officials from the White House. We brought the, the minister of the, uh, labor from France. Uh, and these workshops or the uh, round tables that were hosted was to to drive this exchange between public private partnership because this workforce uh, development is not just an uh, individual problem it's not just a company problem but it's a national problem it's a national crisis right governments have started to understand that that you know if their workforce is not skilled uh, they will not, their country, their, 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 their counties or their cities will not attract uh, new, uh, new, new investment, will not create new jobs. So this is the underpinning, you know, the, uh, a, a skilled workforce is the underpinning for everything, right? Even for nations. So mm -hmm. it's a great time where this recognition has started uh, happening in the, in the consciousness uh, of public officials. And uh, we are seeing that our role, as since we have already been uh, a platform for, for nationwide upskilling, uh, we are bringing uh, governments uh, and private sector together and saying, look, this is a problem that we all have to work together and we have to build an ecosystem around it. There's a lot of money, uh, I mean, uh, funding available as well because governments do keep aside uh, workforce development funds and they are not channelized currently because they don't understand all the latest, greatest technologies. Private sector is always very e efficient and effective with uh, their spending uh, because it's, it's a for-profit, you know, share company. With, yeah. with uh, accountability to shareholders. So there's a lot of good stuff that the private sector CHROs, we brought in a number of CHROs from large fortune uh, 50 companies from here in the US. Uh, and they can share with the governments that, you know, how this accountability works. Um, and so uh, this whole future of work is now taken off and it has gotten uh, as the top of the mind agenda for not just the L&D, but it has moved up to the CEO agenda in the companies and it has also moved up into the government agenda that, that's that's good news overall um yeah and i think um uh you know what's re what's really interesting is i think uh, our industry the technology industry uh for a while was could do no wrong yeah. and um and then more recently with uh, certain developments you know i think the public is starting to look to the tech industry to say hey wait a minute you know the, there are there are implications for um, automa automation and um, maybe there's some accountability to help um, the social Im impact of, of of shifting the emphasis of needed skills, right? Yeah. But the solutions can't be, they're bigger than even the biggest tech company. It really has to be a public-private uh, collaboration. I yep. I think we are under-indexed on uh, public-private partnership in this whole uh, learning and skilling area. And uh, that that's where there's a pretty large opportunity. Yeah, it's interesting. I've got some people coming up in in, in the uh, podcast that we actually had uh, Anant Agawal from, from edX uh, talking about this topic. And um, uh, we've got a couple of people from organizations in the US who are working on it too. So there seems to be definitely a movement um, in this direction, which is exciting. Yeah. What What are your customers telling you about the role of L&D organizations in all this, Carl? Do they, can, they, can they play a role? Can they be influential? Yeah, absolutely. I think L&D uh, role has actually enhanced and has become even very respectable just in the last few years, given that this whole upskilling um, and uh, creating a lifelong learning culture has gotten into the CEO's um, mind yeah. now that they, they, rec they recognize that this is important. I think a few years back, 
even when when we started the company i think uh, our experience was that like this whole learning and training was treated like a sideshow and you know it was done by some hr lnd department but the ceos didn't care about it uh, i i'm seeing a dramatic shift to that right and just last two years of uh, just going to davos uh, that so that's the good news that i think lnd is in sharp focus uh, companies and uh, organizations wants to invest more and more uh, they've realized that if they don't trans 